So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the break. So thanks for joining us at the last paper presentation session from day two of this very um, interesting Money View Symposium, second Money View Symposium. So now we will have two very interesting presentations from two money viewers whose work I really admire. So first we'll have Alex Follett from Project Grants with a paper about exchange rates, price levels, and the money standard, uh, monetary standards. And then a presentation from Iñaki Aldasoro from the BIS, uh, presenting about global banks, dollar funding, and regulation. So we're also happy to have Perry Merlin and Frederick Herman as the respect, respective discussant. And yes, each presentation will consist of around 20 to 25 minutes and uh, which discussions will have five minutes each. And then that will leave us with around 20 minutes for general Q&A discussions. So um, with no further ado, please, Alex, would you like to start? The floor is yours. All right, hi everybody. Let me just share my screen here. There it is. Okay, so we're talking about exchange rates, price levels, and the monetary standard. Um, so we did a lot of uh, Money View reading this year, uh, and recently the Money View reading group, we read uh, Perry Merling's first book, uh, The Money Interest and the Public Interest. And I remember um, seeing in that, noticing in that book, it wasn't the first time I'd read it, um, but that when Alan Young is talking about wanting to stick to a gold standard and, and really trying to get back on the gold standard in 1920s and stuff like that, um, he cares about the standard. He doesn't care about gold per se. Uh, he just recognizes that if you anchor your monetary standard on something, uh, then everyone can coordinate better, everything operates uh, more smoothly. Uh, and this is something that actually um, solved a puzzle for me. Uh, when I first took the MOOC, um, we had this uh, Alan Young reading, uh, and a lot of what he was saying was ma made sense, but then he kept um, you know, insisting that the gold standard was important. And I was like, why is he insisting this? Um, and I thought, okay, I just chalked it up to a product of the time. He doesn't know anything better or anything like that. But he wasn't saying the gold standard is better than another monetary standard. He was saying that a gold standard is better than not having a standard, and he didn't see uh, really what the alternative was. So um, in The Art of Central Banking, uh, Ralph Hotry describes how uh, central banks maintain uh, fixed prices between notes and gold, um, not only using uh, reserves to absorb uh, mismatches in supply and demand, but also uh, by using monetary policy to, to dampen those mismatches. So he kind of describes uh, kind of the mechanisms behind maintaining the gold standard, how central banks do that, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and, and Perry, in, in lecture 15 and 16 of the MOOC, um, he starts by des describing an international monetary system, 19th century gold standard international monetary system, uh, and the mechanisms of that, uh, and then tries to generalize some of that thinking or apply it to a modern uh, uh, floating exchange rate um, world. Um, and the way he does that, uh, I, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a different way of generalizing the gold standard um, to today compared to what uh, Perry offers in the MOOC. And I should say caveat that MOOC was a long time ago and this material was all fresh at the time and, and Perry has been working on this, you know, figuring out the global monetary system for another 10 years since then. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, say that this is a, this is a flaw or anything. Um, so today's global monetary system consists of an uneven patchwork of inconsistently managed uh, currency regimes stitched together with varying degrees of reliability and consistency. Uh, the international gold standard uh, system of the 19th century uh, uh, seems simple by comparison. Uh, in, the, in the lecture notes, uh, Perry says, so long as we are on a gold standard, uh, the analysis is fairly straightforward. Um, and I think we can perhaps carry over some of that straightforwardness uh, to today. Um, we're maybe making it, making it harder on ourselves uh, than we need to. Um, so this is, so there's the question of what is an ideal monetary standard, and that's kind of what I talked about 
last year uh, at the Money View Symposium, like, um, you know, what do you want to anchor your monetary standard to? And then there's the question of um, what are the me mechanics of maintaining a monetary standard? And that's more about um, what this what this talk is about. Uh, and that's th that has a lot of overlap uh, between the gold standard um, and today. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be examining the constraints that disparate monetary standards impose on one another uh, in the context of an international uh, interconnected uh, global economy. So um, I view the price level in particular as a generalization uh, of a gold standard mint par. Um, so, so yeah, let's let's look at the gold standard. Okay, so here's the diagram lifted from uh, lecture 15. Um, I've changed. Uh, uh, Perry was talking about pounds and dollars, and the quote currency was uh, pounds. I have the quote currency as as dollars, and then the imaginary. Uh, the sorry, the the base currency is uh, an imaginary currency I made up called the bell. So you, you've just got, um, you know, you could say you've got a gold standard. So they each have their mint par. The bell is X ounces of gold. The dollar is Y ounces of gold. Um, to for simplicity, you could imagine that Y is one. A dollar is one ounce of gold, and then a bell is uh, ten ounces of gold. So you've got your trainer diagram here. Um, you've got uh, you move further to the right. The uh, the bell depreciates against the dollar, and you know the dealers are taking on uh, more a, a longer position uh, holding bells. Uh, so you've got um, your outside spread, which is set by the dollar central bank and the bell central bank. These are these are the gold points. Um, you know, there's the exchange rates can move around a little bit um, without inducing flows of gold, but um, once uh, it becomes worth it to ship gold, then uh, if you're if the um, exchange rate uh, deviates far enough from the uh, mint par ratio, um, then you're going to make money by, for example, uh, shipping all your uh, gold to the uh, to the Bell Central Bank uh, and then uh, buying dollars with it and turning it back into more bells and, and you know like that kind of thing. There's there's an, there's an arbitrage there. Um, so so this is. Uh, we can look at the gold standard uh, as kind of a prototypical example of a monetary standard because the mechanics of the gold standard uh, can be analyzed separately from the from the question of how suitable it is as a standard. That's kind of what I was saying before. Um, anchoring uh, our monetary frame of reference to gold is as, is as straightforward uh, as it gets. Um, in uh, in the money interest and the public interest, uh, Perry says, the, the question remains, um, however, toward what equilibrium, if any, was the system tending and what forces were leading to that equilibrium. Uh, Young's support for a return to the gold standard can be understood as an attempt to provide the missing uh, equilibrium uh, reference point uh, to orient the post-war uh, evolution of the monetary. I guess I already basically covered all that. Um, so, Let's move on to the price level. Look at this. Look at these two slides. What changes? So the mint par ratio, that is um, a ratio of price levels. Uh, this is, you know, in the gold standard, what you're really doing is, is you have a purchasing power parity system. You're just talking about the purchasing power uh, of your currency with respect to one commodity, which is gold. Um, so if you move into um, you know, a modern system, the now your purchasing power um, is kind of calibrated with respect to a basket of commodities. Um, so you still have these kind of um, import export points for your basket of goods. Each good is, you know, easier or harder to ship and maybe you're shipping from different locations. So, so the boundaries are all a little bit fuzzy, uh, but the same basic structure applies. If you drift far enough away from purchasing power parity, um, then something's gonna have to give. Now, a difference uh, for, for today um, compared to the gold standard is that the central banks are not maintaining um, you know, inventories of uh, the basket of commodities. There have been people who have suggested this um, uh, at various times, um, but it's kind of uh, impractical to do that. Uh, so I just wanna note that here. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Um, but yeah, just I, I want to uh, you know just emphasize the symmetry between a gold standard world um, with um, mint uh, mint par ratios and a uh, 
uh, price price level fiat targeting uh, the price level world where you have um, uh, uh, kind of a, a purchasing power, a fuzzy purchasing power parity constraint. Um, so I would say, say that. Um, then you also have, um, okay, yeah, so the, the yeah, so the purchasing power parity is, is kind of, uh, um, you know, this dotted line in the middle here, and then you have the uh, outside spread with the, uh, the import export points. Um, so there's also uh, interest rate parity, right? So we talk about this in the money view, uh, uncovered interest parity, uh, covered interest parity. Um, so this is the idea that um, if you can borrow in one cu currency and, and lend into another and you get different interest rates, you know, there's an arbitrage there as well. Um, so you can imagine in, in this trainer diagram here, I've highlighted the inside spread. Um, as, the, as you move uh, the exchange rate along this inside spread, those dealers um, kind of move around in there, um, uh, interest rate parity is generally gonna, gonna hold, um, whether that's, uh, if it's uncovered interest parity, you can imagine that everybody knows um, what the future um, uh, spot exchange rates of all the currencies are going to be, so nobody needs to hedge ever. And then uncovered interest parity works, um, and then and then covered interest parity. Um, you know, you, you guys know that story, uh, and I don't need to get into that. Um, so, even if two currencies have uh, relative domestic price levels that are pushed away from perfect purchasing power parity, uh, interest rate parity um, uh, still holds. Uh, and this is related to you know you can see interest rate, you can see exchange rates bopping all around, but you don't see price levels bopping all around. Well. Um, you know, that's because there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway in there. That doesn't mean that purchasing power parity uh, isn't important. Uh, so sometimes we might say that, well, maybe purchasing power parity uh, works uh, in the long run, but it's also true that it sets an outside spread in the short run. Um, so now let's talk about central banks as money dealers. Um, so this is just um, a, a simple central bank. Um, you know, it's a gold standard central bank. Um, and it lets people uh, shift between notes and gold. Notes are its own liability and gold are um, kind of its reserves. Um, and that's very straightforward. Uh, but the thing is that central banks don't wanna do this, right? Their inventories of gold, their gold reserves uh, absorb uh, order flow imbalances in gold, right? Um, and you know you can run out of reserves and you, you don't want kind of like an ongoing drain or something like that. Um, so what they do is they use monetary policy to prevent having to do any of this kind of stuff. So you could imagine that if they were perfect at this, then they wouldn't need any reserves. If they were perfect at um, you know, uh, making sure there were no uh, order flow imbalances in gold, um, then their reserves wouldn't be touched. And therefore, you know, if they had no reserves, it wouldn't, wouldn't make any difference. Um, so you could ask what happens if they fail? What if you come up against that gold point? Uh, well, you can't have a gold drain because they don't have any gold to drain. Uh, instead, what you're going to have is you're going to have um, uh, a violation of, of, of mint par. Um, but it's... Um, it's not, uh, it's not a fundamentally different thing. And the reason why I, why I bring this up is because the modern world, as I was saying before, the central banks don't have inventories of the basket of goods, but they're still trying to do this kind of thing, like stabilizing uh, you know, the price level of that basket of commodities by using monetary policy. So they're acting as dealers, um, but they're not um, you know, directly um, you know, promising to give you uh, some kind of base, uh, uh, higher money or something in exchange for in exchange for their own liabilities or something like that. They're managing the stability of the price uh, in another way. Um, so that's that. Um, so central banks, what did I do? Okay, yeah. Uh, so blah, 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 I said all that. Um, so uh, where does the ultimate demand for money come from? So when we talk about uh, dealers in the economy uh, and we think about um, ultimate supply and demand, um, you can think about that the ultimate supply and demand as uh, uh, kind of implying a certain, a certain price, um, that kind of thing uh, for, for a normal commodity. Um, and then the dealers come in and they you know, provide liquidity and you have to pay them for that. And then it pulls uh, that price um, away from its kind of fundamental value. Um, so, so what I'm arguing here is that money is all that. It's, it's, there is no ultimate demand. It's all, it's all dealers. Everything is a distortion away from the fundamental because there is no there is no fundamental. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so, so 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 that's the idea here. And and then so 
it's entirely, you know, the, you know, the price, whichever price level we choose is arbitrary. Um, so it's entirely about the dealers stabilizing the price and the central banks go in as dealers um, to provide that stability. So um, another thing to keep in mind with respect to kind of the nature of money, the double coincidence of wants is about order flow imbalance. Uh, in, in a barter economy, if two people trading don't have uh, what the other one wants, uh, then you're done. Uh, so money is kind of a form of generic inventory that absorbs any order flow imbalance because if people can shift in and out of money uh, at any time, uh, then you're okay. So that's kind of, money is naturally a, a, a dealer a dealer-based instrument. And not just dealers in the sense of passive dealers who set bid-ask spreads, but in terms of I'm always uh, receiving money uh, and I'm always buying and selling money in the sense that I'm always selling and buying stuff uh, in, in my life. Um, so I'm kind of a, you know, we're all in a sense, uh, in a sense, money dealers. So mon money is a dealer, a dealer instrument. Um, so we talk about the international money hierarchy, um, you know, the constraints I was just, um, you know, kind of went over with my trainer diagrams, they apply to any, any currency pair, right? Um, uh, but in, in practice, um, there are some, uh, you know, uh, central banks who have uh, more uh, impact than the others, right? There's the international uh, money hierarchy. And if you're the Fed, then your monetary policy is going to propagate out to everyone else who's integrated into the uh, international monetary system. Um, so, you know, there are questions about um, what we can do about that. Um, uh, capital and trade restrictions. Um, so capital restrictions, um, you know, allow um, interest rates to, to kind of, uh, they, they stand in the way of, of interest rate arbitrage is one way to put it. Uh, and trade restrictions stand in the way of uh, 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 purchasing power uh, parity arbitrage. Um, so I would say that uh, one way you can think about it is that uh, capital controls widen the inside spread and trade restrictions uh, widen the outside spread. So here are, um, yeah, so it looks kind of like this. Um, essentially what you're doing is if you have, you know, a complete wall, if there's no um, uh, capital movement and there's no trade, um, then essentially what you've done is you've cut off your economy from the rest of the world and you can do whatever you want with your monetary standard. You can have a really terrible monetary standard um, that maybe isn't ideal for your economy, but it's not being pushed around by um, pressures from uh, the outside world. Or alternatively, if the global economy is using a terrible monetary standard, you could, you could have a good one. Um, but then what you're doing is you're sacrificing, um, you know, the benefit, the gains from trade, uh, and and all of all of that. Um, so you probably um, you might want to do it to some extent. You know, force your people to fend for themselves, to promote financial deepening or industrial development. But you're not going to want to cut yourself off completely because um, you'd lose all benefit uh, from from what everyone else is doing. Um, so uh, I think Kindleberger talks about this. Um, you can think about the international economy as one big closed economy. The global economy is a closed economy. It contains many idiosyncratic sub economies, many of them using monetary standards that are managed by different institutions uh, for different goals. Um, but they all are kind of constrained by each other because they're all integrated uh, into this single system. And I think it might be useful to start thinking about um, managing this or, 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 or understanding um, the system, not from the perspective of, okay, I'm an open economy, what's happening to me, but from the perspective of, from top down saying like, okay, what, um, you know, what does this closed economy look like? And then you can add in kind of the individual economies that are kind of trying to deviate from it. You could even, you know, say like, oh, what if Nebraska wanted to, um, you know, implement its own currency, what would that look like? And maybe there's an analogy there with, um, you know, a peripheral country uh, uh, in the real world. Um, so we're getting to the end. Um, I would say that, you know, main takeaways from this is that our world is more similar to a gold standard world than it might seem. Uh, and gold standard like analysis uh, can potentially help us make sense of a modern uh, kind of fiat standard world. Um, this is, you know, kind of just scratching the surface here. Um, and I'm going to be thinking about this more. I was planning to write a paper. Uh, I was planning to finish writing writing my paper for this. This is the paper; it's not finished, um, but uh, I didn't. So um, I'm I'm interested in feedback, especially if you want to kind of uh, tear anything down, anything like that. That's totally fine. Uh, and this is this is me.
Okay, Alex, thank you uh, for the presentation. I'll just give uh, the floor to Iñaki to, for his presentation. And then we have, we'll have the comments of the discussants and then I will open up for Q&A. So we have uh, the same amount of time to everyone. So maybe Iñaki will do, oh, so you have already your presentation on. So, yes, so you please, can see, you can hear you... me well. Yes, we can. So yes, you okay. can start. <laughs> Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, so this is going to be a very different presentation uh, to what you've seen before. I mean, up to this point, it was more, um, say, conceptual discussions, uh, and now I'm going to kind of grab you by the tissues and drag you through the through the mud of data. It's going to be a very data-intensive uh, presentation. So this is based on joint work with uh, with Torsten Ellers and Egemen Egemen Ellen. Uh, Egemen is uh, still at the BS. Torsten is currently at the at the fund for some time. And the usual disclaimer applies. These are our views, uh, my views, and not those of the BIS or the IMF. And this has also applies to the money views that I might express here as well. Um, we started this paper a long time ago, actually shortly after I joined the, the BIS. And, and when I was uh, somehow I found myself right in a box on the money market fund reform together with Bob, who uh, I'm glad to see that he's here. Um, and and that that is what's what what got us started and there's been many iterations of this paper and it's the first time that i present this latest uh, iteration i haven't been with the paper for for um, i haven't presented the paper for a while so anyway let me get uh, started um so dollar us dollar funding is is the lifeblood of international banking and i, I think this is not going to come as a as a surprising statement to many of the people here non-us banks uh, have a very large footprint in dollar banking circa 13 trillion dollars uh, in terms of uh, in terms of dollar assets it's very similar to those of, of us uh, of the of us banks as well and the whole wholesale dollar funding markets in which these global banks source their dollars from uh, are typically at the forefront of of, of many of the crises that that have uh, been hitting uh, the financial system uh, in recent years the gfc the euro store and the crisis uh, and the COVID crisis as well and one of the key sources of wholesale dollar funding for non-US banks is US market funds through both uh, unsecured uh, and secure, so meaning repo uh, funding instruments. Now, what this paper is going to do is, um, uh, is, is, is going to show that the pricing in this very deep and liquid market is far from competitive. Uh, we will document that there are significant and persistent uh, prices location, and this will arise because this market is essentially an over-the-counter market. And as in many over-the-counter markets, uh, bargaining frictions and market power uh, affect prices. Option outside options matter, uh, and this is also going to to affect uh, to affect prices. To to identify causal effect of of uh, bargaining frictions and market power on prices, we're going to rely on a number of quasi experiments, uh, including the U.S. money market fund reform and the quarter end window dressing uh, by European banks. And we're also going to show that post-crisis regulation have reduced competition in, in these wholesale funding markets and have generated incentives for regulatory arbitrage, which also affect bargaining power and prices. In the interest of time, let me just skip the, the, the outline of the talk and get uh, right to it uh, on the institutional background uh, and data. And here I will go fast as well. I'm not going to dwell on the data. I just want to, 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 to make something clear in terms of the institutional background. U.S. money uh, money funds uh, provide uh, funding to banks, as I said, both through secure, uh, like repos, and, and unsecure instruments like commercial paper and certificates of deposits. In the paper, we're going to lump together also asset-backed commercial paper here within the unsecure bucket. Uh, so it's essentially a repo versus non-repo uh, funding. Uh, and there are essentially three types of funds of, of, of MMFs that interact with uh, with banks. These are prime funds, government funds, uh, and treasury funds. And the prime funds are those that are, allow, are allowed to invest in all of the instruments that I mentioned before. The government funds are the ones that are allowed to invest in uh, treasury securities or agency securities or repos backed by those uh, two types of securities. And the treasury funds just invest in treasuries. And the MMF reform, which is a key, uh, key uh, um, uh, aspect of our paper, uh, required institutional prime funds uh, and money funds and other small type of funds to switch to a floating net asset value calculation, as well as introducing the possibility of imposing uh, redemption gates and fees at the discretion of, of funds. And what is this? What this do? Uh, th what this did? Sorry, uh, effectively is to make prime funds a less attractive option for many money mar market fund investors, uh, and lead led to uh, significant outflows from from prime uh, funds. So essentially, what this uh, represented was a, a significant shock to unsecure 
uh, wholesale global dollar funding for many of these global banks. Um, I'm not going to talk about data, so let me just start with the pricing of dollar, dollar funding, where we show that there, are significant, there is a significant price dispersion. In this graph, I'm showing uh, to the left unsecured funding, to, to the right uh, repo funding, um, and, and showing a price dispersion uh, after controlling for a certain uh, characteristics of contracts and, and, and unobserved counterparty risk. In a competitive market, the contracts with the same risk characteristics should be, in principle, priced the same. And we find that this is not the case here. So there is a significant price dispersion, even after we, we control for a, for a host of, of, uh, of relevant confounding factors that may affect this, uh, this uh, price dispersion. The difference between 75th and 25th percentile is about 40 basis points for unsecured. And it's smaller for repo, fine, but this, this is still economically significant because these are effectively risk-free contacts overnight collateralized with treasury collateral uh, and done by, by highly rated uh, global banks uh, and, and, and money funds. Now, uh, a key structural feature of the US MMF industry, which gives rise to this non-competitive pricing is the high concentration, which increased further following the US money market fund reform, especially in the unsecured segment. And this is what we show in this graph. We show MMF concentration at the fund family level on the left, at the fund, at the fund level on the, on the right. And you see that especially for the unsecured segment, which is the, the, the solid line, solid black line, uh, it increased like crazy. Uh, but not only that, it was already very high to begin with. So the top five families, uh, top five fund families uh, commanded around 60% of market share. Uh, and another important factor for, for, this, uh, for this market is that the um, banks typically form persistent relationships with money market funds. And this type of persistent relationships, again, are a feature of OTC markets more, more broadly. So against this background of persistent price dispersion, market concentration, we construct several measures of market power, uh, which we call MS, essentially they are market shares and bargaining power. We do this at the fund level, at the fund family level and at the bank level. And we do this for each market segment. These are uh, uh, really plain vanilla measures from the, from the over-the-counter uh, uh, markets literature. And here the idea is that a higher fund bargaining power, this FBP should correlate with higher uh, prices and conversely uh, higher uh, bank bargaining power should correlate with lower prices. Uh, and something similar applies for, for, for market shares. So what we do in the papers, we show this in a pure correlation setting or control for a battery of contract characteristics, borrower characteristics, or meaning bank characteristics, including the riskiness, and also battery of fixed effects. And we show this in a correlation setting, but this, this uh, yet that does not identify a causal effect of bargaining power on prices. And this is what we do next. But before I move to the next slide, just uh, again, you can see here the time series of the measures that we have constructed for the market shares uh, and, the, and the fund bargaining power uh, at, the, at the fund level, at the fund family level, which is F star, and the same for bank, uh, bank bargaining, bargaining power. You see bank, bank bargaining power switches a bit, but it's not that, not that much and it goes back quickly. But for uh, fund bargaining power, especially at the fund family level, so it's this one here, and in terms of market shares, which is this one here, uh, it goes up a lot, whereas for banks uh, here, bank market power, uh, bank market shares uh, are essentially flat. Um, so what we do is uh, run a, a difference in difference uh, estimation around the money market fund reform the period, like it was six month window, uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, around the money market fund reform. And the logic here is that with, with fund closures and, and the overall volume decline that we have seen uh, uh, in this episode, the funds or the fund families uh, saw an exogenous uh, increase in their market in the market and bargaining power just by staying open for business. And the main hypothesis that we put forward is that if a fund commands the same market share before and after the reform, then it can charge a higher price after the reform. And this is what we see. Uh, what we see, for instance, here, uh, when when we see the interaction of of the market share of the fund family and the post reform. Uh, that the prices are considerably uh, considerably higher, not so for when we look at the market share of the bank. And if we focus on the fund bargaining power at the fund family level, we see again the same uh, the same effect. Uh, and this is our actually our preferred uh, uh, way of estimating this because these measures are done at the at the bank bank fund family level, which means that we can control uh, for for bank date and fund date fixed effects, uh, which allow us to there to purge. Uh, all of the variation that is coming from demand and supply and focus squarely on, on bargaining power. Um, so we do this first for, for unsecure, but then uh, another, another corollary of this is uh, that there is a, the, the flip side of the, of, of the market, which is the secure market. And an implication of the reform 
was that as the supply of unsecured funding became scarce, uh, um, the repo market saw an increase in supply of funding because essentially many many market money market funds converted their, their prime funds, which again could invest in everything, to non-prime funds, which could only invest in in, in treasury or, or repos backed by treasuries. So due to the increased outside options of, of banks, in this case, the funds uh, bargaining power in the repo market should thus be lower in the post-reform period. And indeed, this is what we find, that the bargaining power of funds is greater in the unsecured market, while it is lower in the repo segment. And this you can see here with this triple interaction, for instance, I'm just gonna focus say on this one uh, at the at the fund family level uh, after the reform the fund bargaining power at the fund family for the repo market is reduced in terms of and uh, as, as measured by by the effect on prices and for the unsecured market which is when the repo dummy is a zero uh, we see a, a positive effect uh, and again here in in these last two columns we are focusing only on prime funds uh, which are again those that can invest in in in, in both markets. So uh, essentially, we are comparing the same fund uh, doing uh, doing a repo versus doing uh, unsecure uh, providing unsecure funding to the same bank. Um, so so up up to this point is essentially the key key is, if you will the key results of the paper showing causally that that, that that this is an OTC market where bargaining frictions matter and they affect prices and we show how they affect prices. And, and what we do next is um, is combine this with information in the changes on on the on these banks' business models, uh, and also with changes in regulation, and see uh, how all of this comes together to again also affect prices. And and here I'm going to go quickly on this one. There, there has been a, a growing divergence in global banks' business models, which has implications for the dollar funding uh, demand profiles. Uh, here I'm showing the consolidated dollar assets of, uh, at, at the global level from the BIS consolidated banking stats. Uh, and we see that European banks have reduced the dollar banking activities, whereas Japanese banks, which are this red line, uh, and Canadian banks, which is, are these blue lines, uh, have continued to grow. And this is very well documented in a very nice paper from Bob, uh, um, Pat, and, and, and others um, that I strongly recommend you to read. Um, but the, the divergence occurred not only in size, uh, um, also in terms of composition. And here I'm switching gears. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, call report data, so at the bank level data uh, from uh, the foreign uh, branches, agencies, and subsidiaries of foreign banks in the US. Uh, and, and also look at uh, um, sort of unpacking what is going on uh, within, their, within their balance sheets. And, and here there are three items that are worth noticing, got at least three items that are worth noticing. In terms of the uh, of the drastic change in the sources and uses of dollars by non-US global banks, number one is the notable contrast regarding the importance of bank loans, which tend to be longer-term assets. Uh, and here, Japanese banks stand out this purple area here, uh, the, and to some extent also Canadian. But for the rest, they kind of shifted completely away from this from that business model. The second is that uh, banks of some nationalities, and notably uh, French banks and Canadian banks, became very very large repo intermediaries. This is a bit hard to see in this graph. There's going to be another graph later that will show you this in more detail. Uh, and at the same time, Japanese banks are massive repo, repo borrowers. Uh, and a third interesting uh, aspect is that after 2011, most European banks massively shifted their activities towards uh, short-term arbitrage, including repo arbitrage, but also interest on exchange reserve uh, arbitrage. And of course, these changes have implications for dollar funding demand because if you have a very large loan book, then you're going to be uh, trying to get uh, longer. Um, uh, longer maturity uh, funding uh, as a counterpart to those uh, to those sticky long-term assets. Uh, and indeed, Japanese banks, together with Canadian banks, were the largest recipients of unsecured funding before the reform, in line with that, that sort of business model. These are the two lines that you see here. Uh, and around the reform, they, they, they basically collapsed. So they were the most affected by the reform, and they, they were the most in need of, of uh, long-term dollar funding. Uh, and at the same time, we know and we have seen that the that the that the yen dollar basis saw the largest widening uh, around the time of, of of the reform. Canadian banks are a bit different than Japanese banks because they have very very large subsidiaries in the U.S., uh, which essentially have uh, access to to secure uh, to uh, to to retail deposits. Um, so what we what we show next uh, in in this in this in this analysis is that an increase in the market power or bargaining power of a fund family should lead to higher prices for Japanese banks compared to others post reform because of this inelastic demand for dollar funding and because they were the one, the, the ones that suffer uh, the most and then this is this is what we find here uh, where we where we look at uh, Japanese banks and we see that post reform um, 
the fund bargaining power affects. Uh, so basically, they are charge higher. They are charge higher prices uh, post reform um, in the in the unsecure market, and we don't see any such effect for for Canadian banks. Now, uh, a second exercise that we do is uh, linking uh, window dressing by European banks, especially French banks, at quarter ends and repo pricing. And then we're going to look at spillovers and FX swaps, picking up on a theme that, that Elham uh, uh, touched upon, and I think also done in one of the comments. Um, so here, what is important to know is that there, was, there has been an heterogeneous implementation of Basel III uh, regulations across jurisdictions. In particular, I'm talking about the leverage ratio, which some countries, uh, some jurisdictions could apply uh, on, a, on a quarter and snapshot basis and another ones on, on an average of quarter basis. What this means is that some banks could essentially blow up their balance sheet within the quarter and then on the 31st of March, contract it, and then on the 2nd of April, 3rd of April, expand it back again. And this was indeed, uh, um, uh, had been, and now it kind of moderated a bit, but it had been a very big, uh, very big issue, especially for, for French banks, which is this jigsaw puzzle that you said. A jigsaw uh, behavior that you see here uh, to the tune of 200 billion. This is a, a lot of money. And what this means when you think about the, uh, the OTC and nature of this market is that money market funds temporarily saw their bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis other banks uh, reduce because they traditionally transacted with French banks, come quarter and French banks disappear and they need to still to place uh, that, uh, that money. So what we expect uh, with all of this background is that non-EU banks should pay less for repo funding at quarter ends, and that this should strengthen after the introduction of the leverage ratio disclosure requirements, which, which happened in January 2015, and also that the effect is weaker or even non-existent for no overnight repos with treasury collateral. Because in this case, the uh, MMFs have a very credible outside option with the overnight reverse repo facility of the Fed, uh, which started, uh, uh, became, became operational in September 2013. So there is a very credible outside option, so we should not see a pricing effect there. And indeed, what we see is that uh, first, uh, non-European banks do, do receive favorable repo, favorable repo pricing uh, at quarter ends. Uh, you see this in terms of the small price that they are paying at quarter ends. Uh, we also see that this is even stronger. So on top of that effect, it's, it becomes even stronger after the leverage ratio disclosure requirement, when this behavior became even more pronounced uh, by, by the window dressing banks. And we also see that the presence of the of the Fed in the overnight treasury repo market results in a larger bargaining power for MMFs and therefore higher prices for repos with treasury collateral. So we the point estimate is actually positive even, even though it's a, it's a non uh, not significant. Um, finally, what we do is um, we, we we recap on all of this. So number one, lots of money moving around in repos and very distinct repo balance sheets. And here you can, uh, this is the graph that I was mentioning where I was zooming, where I was zooming in the branch repo positions. Uh, you see French banks, Canadian banks, and you see the massive repo books for Japanese banks. So uh, recapping on the on the items that we saw before, large inelastic demand for dollar funding by Japanese entities, uh, um, widening of the yen dollar basis, uh, which also has a very uh, strong uh, quarter and pattern as well. Large uh, match repo books by French and Canadian banks and very large repo borrowing by, by Japanese banks. And we conjecture regardless this, that the French banks intermediate repos to Japanese banks. And we ask ourselves whether this can have wider implications for dollar funding markets more broadly. And here, what we have in mind is, uh, uh, is, is whether this should, this should affect, in principle, other instruments downstream in the hierarchy, like FX swaps or upstream, depending on how you set up the, uh, the, the hierarchy. But, but I think you, you, you get the point. I mean, the, the FX swaps are the marginal source of funding for banks. Uh, and if something happens, uh, some stress happens uh, in, in lower parts of the hierarchy, then this should be affecting FX swaps. Uh, FX swaps uh, uh, as well, and and what we find is that uh, we find a statistically and economically significant negative relationship between the changes in repo activities of French banks at quarter ends and the contemporaneous change in the yen dollar uh, basis. And we find that around 65% of the change in the yen dollar basis, the one week dollar basis, uh, in quarter ends is explained by this change in, in French banks uh, repos. And importantly, this is only present for short maturity tenors, uh, and it's not not present for longer maturity tenors, which you see here with the three month and and one year. Uh, and this is because the the need to plug the, the the funding hole is temporary because the French banks come back to the market shortly thereafter. Uh, so here, the logic is that if if the French banks intermediate repos to Japanese banks and they disappear from the market, then the Japanese banks have a have a big uh, big funding hole dollar funding hole to to plug at the end of the quarter. And this should be reflected higher up the hierarchy, 
uh, and we find that it is reflected in the in in the in the yen dollar basis, um, and and uh, and that this this effect this effect is very short lived because the French banks or other or other banks as well come back to the market shortly thereafter. So to conclude um, here, um, basically, uh, and and to tie it back to to the title of the paper, uh, what we show is global banks are increasingly different since the GFC. Uh, their demand for dollar funding has become increasingly heterogeneous. Uh, and, and a point that, that is not new because Bob actually had made it as well, is that no one size no longer fits all in global banking. Up to the GFC, you could think about all of these uh, uh, global international banks as, as moving uh, in tandem. Uh, and since then, this, is no, this no longer applies, uh, and especially since the euro crisis as well. Uh, second, dollar funding markets are not perfectly competitive. The supply side is highly concentrated. It is an OTC market, so it is subject to bargaining and market power uh, uh, frictions, which matters for, for prices. And third, regulation can have unintended consequences for dollar funding markets. So for one, heterogeneous implementation of Basel III can lead to regulatory arbitrage, uh, the, the endogenous formations of opaque uh, and complex uh, short-term dollar funding uh, networks, and also spillovers uh, to other markets. And in terms of the US uh, MMF reform, we show that improving the credit quality of MMF assets, MMF assets has come at the expense of a reduction in competition in a market that was already concentrated to begin with. Uh, and, and, and this also raises the question whether it could also lead to international spillovers as well. And we have, a, I put a plug for another paper that we have where we show this, that this affects banks uh, unrelated to MMFs in other jurisdictions. So this is all, and I'm happy to, to hear uh, from you. Thank you, Nyaki, for a very intriguing presentation and for keeping up with the time. So both of you were really fast. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll just give uh, the floor to Frederick, who will discuss Alex's paper. Thank you very much, Natalie. I hope everybody uh, can hear me. Otherwise, please sound out. Um, <clears throat> Uh, perhaps, Inyaki, you can turn off the presentation. I think that'd be helpful for everybody. Um, just a, a brief intro about who I am. Uh, I've been a student of Perry's uh, and I've remained so long after I stopped taking a course of his. And um, as opposed to many people on this call, I, I turned the money view into a career in, in the practitioner space. Uh, I work at JP Morgan and I've done so for the last five years, basically since I came out of a Paris course at Columbia. And um, and I'm very grateful to be still attached to this group and and you know get bombarded with all these amazing ideas. Um, and thank you very much, Alex, for your uh, presentation and like um, and everything we heard in there. There are so many sort of big thoughts in there to unpack. Um, so I think uh, I think I'll try and just touch on a few of them and um, and uh, and try and encourage. I don't know relative path after that. So I think um, I think as a base uh, case, it's it's very interesting to understand sort of the wider constraints uh, or to put it in the terms of the trainer model, the outside spread of a lot of these markets. I think uh, I tried doing something similar when I once wrote a paper about the breakdown of coverage covered interest rate parity. Uh, with respect to the FX markets, because here was a relationship that had worked uh, forever uh, and um, then stopped working during the crisis. But then also all of a sudden, after some of the, the regulatory reforms that Inyaki mentioned started breaking down um, in a non-crisis time. And and it's it, it says something about the trainer model as a, as a framework for understanding, because it works very well when you have a very well-defined outside spread uh, uh, some sort of arbitrage condition that there is a pool of capital to exploit, but then the system gets pressured or reconfigured in a while. So we kind of have to search for a new uh, outside spread. And I think that's a very hard challenge. And, and I think this is a very great uh, sort of piece of work towards that. Um, but I do think that it's a necessity of, of understanding the world through the trainer model to sometimes reconfigure it a little bit, or maybe we're just uh, getting closer and closer to the to the real understanding of, of the world. But I think putting in the the purchasing power parity, of course, links this way back to 
uh, to sort of classic macroeconomics and and the purchasing power parity, um, which is, as I recall from my my intermediary macro course, is fairly well established. And I think, uh, especially as you mentioned, Alex, on a long in a long run period of time, I, I think this arbitrage condition does enforce itself on currency rate. But one question I would pose to you, and and especially excited to read your paper when that comes out, is thinking a little bit about timeframes and, and what kind of what kind of time frame you're working at because you know if you if you define the outside arbitrage or the outside spread sort of more clearly and say like well what are the conditions for these um i would think you're referring to commodity traders in the end because we're talking about tradable goods and and um or maybe not solely commodity traders but but dealers in, in tradable goods across the world. Describing that sort of mechanism a little bit closer, I think would be very interesting. And then also comparing it to uh, some sort of, um, shall we say more central bank based view of the outside spread. Because I think I had a wonderful occasion to reread Perry's lecture note from the lecture 16. And I thank Alex for pointing me in the right direction just to get a little bit prepared for this paper where uh, Perry, of course, talks about this, the covered interest parity as an outside outside spread and covered interest rate parity broke down, one might say, because you know commercial dealers didn't have unlimited balance sheet space anymore and then couldn't perform this arbitrage. But actually in the lecture note, um, there's a great deal of a conversation about central banks and how they are ultimately policing this outside spread. And, as we've learned from later work from Paris, one central bank in particular, as the Fed has more and more come to terms with this international deal of last resort. I think it would be interesting to contrast sort of the, the real economy, you know, one melon's price in New York versus one melon's price in Japan and like how that arbitrage uh, can enforce itself on the exchange rate with how um, central banks even kind of operate within this framework. Um, because I, I think, Something that was very interesting back in a few years ago, when when the when the the euro was appreciating and we're we're close to 1.25, and the the executive committee all of a sudden starting talking about where well, there are limits to how how valuable the the euro can get. It's it sounded as if there was an outside spread in mind from the central bank, and even the purchasing power spread is maybe even beyond that. I, I I'd be interested in that dynamic. And then also a little bit uh, curious about the dealers. Um, who are the dealers in, in, this, uh, in this particular framework? Um, and who are, the, who, who are moving commodities back and forth to, in the inside spread and who are moving commodities back and forth to the outside spread? I think that would be interesting. And then I think the last point um, I was gonna make and, and it sort of relates to the thing I said in the beginning about time horizon, but I think you already touched upon this, but it'd be interesting to get a little bit more on whether this is a static or a dynamic framework, because I think, you know, absolute prices is, is, is hard to, it's hard to sort of fit with purchasing power parity, but there are better results when you look at uh, weather inflation rates and, and, and currency devaluation appreciations. But as I said, um, very interesting presentation, and I really look forward to to reading more uh, uh, about your work in this in this context, I think it's very interesting, and it's a great use of the trainer model to sort of broaden broaden our thinking in uh, in areas where we we're not used to seeing it. So I think I went a little bit over, but there was so much to unpack, and I, I just want to say uh, thanks, Alex. I, I really look forward to uh, following it further down the line. It's fine, Frederick. I'll let Alex digest all your good comments. And we'll give the word to Perry to comment on Iñaki's paper. So. Yes. Um, so I guess this is a new iteration of an older paper. And, and uh, there's a bunch of papers. Um, and I will even make some connections to other BIS papers. So I'm an avid reader of the BIS working paper series, and I, I encourage it. Um, sometimes you have to do a little work to translate this into many view terms, and that's that's sort of what I'm going to do here. Um, Iñaki thinks sort of like a microeconomist in this here. You know, he's thinking about individual business models. He's thinking about bargaining power bilaterally and so forth. 
And from a macroeconomic point of view, you know, we think there's sort of one money market, you know, globally, one capital market globally, and that there's sort of one price for money. And so maybe there's a, you know, a, a short rate complex, you know, but it's sort of, they move together and, and the spreads are because of imbalances in various ways and so forth. And so I'm going to propose a macroeconomic uh, interpretation of the patterns that he that he points out. Um, this is actually a, a, a proposal that I have been teaching for a couple of years. Um, so I don't know if it's true or not, you know, and I would be very interested to hear uh, Inyaki's uh, 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 view on it. And I guess, you know, Bob, Bob McCauley too, um, because I, I realized I've been thinking of this as a stylized fact about the world and it may not be a stylized fact about the world. Um, and uh, so I made a little, uh, a little one slide here. Um, so, which I'm gonna share my screen here. So global dollar funding, um, a schema. Okay, so the, the parts of this, oh, let me just enlarge that, okay. So the parts of this uh, picture that Inyaki is talking about are Japan and France, okay. Um, I have added in um, emerging markets um, as the source of the dollar assets that, J that Japan is, is accumulating. Um, and actually also as the uh, source of the overnight funding that France has been, has been going out for. Um, uh, this is a stylized picture, but, but there are reasons to put that in. One of the things that's happened since the global financial crisis is enormous growth in, in dollar-based funding to the global south um, of, the, of the corporations, the national champions, and also of, of sort of central bank dollar reserves. So I'm just adding those stylized facts in here. Um, the important part where it connects to Inyaki is, is this idea that sort of Japan is, is, is sort of getting long-term funding for its dollar book um, and that the European countries, in particular France, um, have moved their books to shorter term. So I'm showing them. So I'm, I'm showing basically the global the global shadow banking system, uh, money market funding of capital market lending, um, but 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 distributed across multiple countries, um, and in fact, completely offshore in in these pictures here. So this is the offshore dollar system. He's concerned about where this offshore dollar system connects to the onshore dollar system, thinking of the money market mutual funds as as intermediaries providing funding to Japan to France um, for their for their dollar books. Okay. okay. Oh, oh, that's not me. Okay, the um, uh, so that's how I understand this this paper um, is that he's thinking about that first bullet point there, money market mutual funds as as intermediaries for the Japanese and French funding. Um, but you can connect other things that he mentions sort of on the side. Um, he does show you the 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 movement of the of the FX swap basis. Um, and uh, in crises and so forth. Um, and it's important to appreciate that the important FX swaps from this macroeconomic point of view are, are, the, are the yen and the euro, um, because that's about squaring up your, your currency exposure um, if, you, if you wind up be having a mismatch or something. Um, and you do see blowouts in those spreads um, at, 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 crisis, at crisis times. Um, and, uh, and then I guess the third bullet point, which is, which is more you know, in a, 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 a hobby horse of my own, is understanding the central bank liquidity swap lines um, as a backstop for these FX basis swap markets. Um, and uh, those kicked in big time in the COVID crisis. They kicked in big time in the global financial crisis. And um, the political economy of those, which we've heard many people talk about, um, seems no longer to be problematic um, in the sense that when Bernanke did this, he was called before Congress and, and nobody called the Fed before Congress this time. Um, so it's sort of accepted that the, that, the, uh, that the Federal Reserve is the global dollar backstop, the global central bank. Um, that's a new fact about, about the world. Um, so I just want to show you one more slide and then I will uh, stop. Um, and here it is. Um, uh, Dan, uh, this morning made reference to my uh, 
beautiful nine trainer diagram um, uh, story. This is in the, in a paper, uh, working paper, a recent one of International Lender of Last Resort, where I'm showing how the new the new sense in which the, the Fed is the is the lender of last resort, dealer of last resort, um, but at different locations in the in the global system, um, that within the United States, it's basically at all maturities. So it's a dealer of last resort in 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 treasuries, um, and therefore it also recently in in, in corporate uh, debt too uh, in the COVID crisis. Um, for the global north, um, there are these C6 liquidity swaps that really integrate the, the money markets. Um, and for the global south, um, they now have this FEMA repo facility. Um, and uh, that's a new thing um, that, is, that is available just in, just in the last couple of months, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, the, I'm showing these as separate trainer diagrams. Um, and uh, this morning, Dan was call, calling upon us to think about the interactions between these or something. Um, I, I hear that. Um, but I've this gray bar here, the, the, the gray shade is meant to indicate the scope of the global uh, lender of last resort function of the Fed um, and, and its hierarchical character. Um, this is a first crack at it. Um, and so I, I put that out there to maybe stimulate people doing better than, than me. Um, and uh, I will... I think that's it. Oh, uh, the last thing I'll say, the, um, those lectures 15 and 16 um, got turned into an academic paper that's called um, Essential Hybridity, um, A Money View of FX. Um, I think it's basically the same as those lectures, but it's, it's a little more polished. Um, so the, you, you might wanna have a look at that. I do change the definition of the exchange rate so that all the, cor all the curves slope the opposite way. Um, just for, uh, but so don't get confused by that, but there, that, that exists. Um, and I think that's 2013. So that, that's a long time ago. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Barry. I'll give the floor to Alex to have a time to answer the discussion.